and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and said, we're not alone. Hello, everyone. This is Martin Willis, your host. Welcome to the show. We're coming at you live on the Dark Matter Radio Network, like every Wednesday from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, now wait a minute. Did I just say 8 p.m. to 10 p.m.? That's right. That's two hours. Yes. This week, we are starting a two-hour live show that you can hear right here every week for free. Before we get into details about that, Alejandro Rojas will be coming up from Open Minds. He's going to be sitting in for about a half hour to talk about UFO events. And then at the half hour, we have a special guest, an Academy Award winning Doug Trumbull. And he will be talking to us about his UFOTOG project. And joining him will be a repeat guest, one of my favorites, astronomer and MUFON photo video analyst, Mark D'Antonio. So here are the upcoming changes. You can listen for free right here on the Dark Matter Radio Network every Wednesday from 8 to 10 p.m. But only the first hour will be made into a free podcast that will come up on our website, podcastufo.com, and iTunes and Stitcher and all that, as usual. New subscribers or people who have been subscribing or donating will be able to access the second hour as a podcast on a platform called getjoyride.com that's getjoyride.com and this will be launched on December 1st the site's not up currently there'll be a monthly bonus podcast that will not be live that subscribers can listen to as well subscribers pay only 4.99 or more per month for this and more details will follow closer to the launch on December 1st The second half of the shows, like the one we are recording tonight, will be archived on GetJoyRide.com as soon as it's launched. However, don't panic. I will send a link of the MP3 file to anyone to download that has been donating or has donated in the past or has been subscribing all along. We won't forget you. Well, that's it for the details. I know it's a little bit confusing. But just keep in mind, if you want to listen live for two hours for free, come here. Or if you want to hear the second half of our podcast, all you have to do is subscribe for four ninety nine or more per month on GetJoyRide.com coming December 1st. And if you decide you want to start subscribing right now to hear the second part, go right ahead on our website, PodcastUFO.com, and I'll simply send you the link to download the MP3 files. All righty, so now it's time to call in Alejandro Rojas. How are you, Alejandro? I am doing wonderful, much warmer than the last time we talked. That's right, and I want to really thank you for last week finding Travis Walton on in the dark side of a mountain <laughs> in a forest, and you uh-huh. picked him out of the crowd of a bunch of people. I got a lot of email of people just loving that you did that because it sounded like they were right there with you. Well, it's awesome. Yeah, the timing was perfect because I was like, well, this is going to be a loss. You know, it's been three or so hours and we've had no sign of anybody. And, uh, you know, everybody started driving up right when uh, we got on the phone. So and luckily I was able to find him in those the dark masses of people out there. And I have to say, I hate to say it this way, but you were plan B. (laughs) And you're plan B. Yeah, I know. But, no, it was like, okay, I'm speaking with Travis Walton on the satellite phone that he never used that I sent out there. And uh, yeah. plan B was you and I were going to talk, and it just the whole thing just worked out great. And how yeah. was the rest of the conference, the summit? It's somewhat similar to that evening <laughs> in that okay. Travis was pretty much late to everything, uh, but uh, and the scheduling and organizing wasn't... Um, 
very strong. Uh, I think maybe alien abductees should not uh, organize their own conferences. Uh, having someone else doing that would might be a good idea. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like out there, it was incredible. It was really cool stuff, uh, a unique uh, experience. So it was kind of as long as you're willing to kind of show up at nine o'clock is what I said, and you know, and be there for twelve hours. Who knows what's going to happen when? But you're probably going to have a good time and see some interesting stuff. Then then you're good. You definitely had to have kind of a, a laid-back attitude about things. Now, did you go to the site again the next day? I didn't because luckily I was there during the day. Uh, I think I said that bef- that we were able to find someone, luckily, right. uh, who forest- took us up to the site. Yeah, a forest uh, ranger. And... And so we got to see the site during the day and everything, and that was enough for us. We didn't need to go back up uh, the next day. But those poor people who had to wait there for three hours or so and didn't get up there until the dead of night, they took those people back the next day so they could see it during the day. <laughs> and then they further went to the courthouse and where, the, where he landed and where he went to the phone booth and all that, right? Yeah, so that was kind of funny. The phone booth is actually near uh, where the venue was in Heber, and about an hour away in Holbrook is the famous courthouse that you see in the movie a lot. Uh, We interviewed Travis at the courthouse in the courtroom, but uh, funny enough, Travis was really never at that courthouse. It was more uh, his co-workers while they were being accused of murdering Travis. They were taken there. That's where their polygraph tests were held. Uh, so, uh, so. It, but the it's a really historic, really neat place. We posted a bunch of pictures. We'll have a video with our interview with Travis there uh, up in like the next week. But. Um, This was another funny thing because it was a press conference they held out there. I think it would have been better if it was just an excursion to take people to look at it and bring them back because there was no press at the press conference. Oh, that's Um, sad. That's too bad. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, you had to get all these people out there. Again, Travis was late and showed up after the press conference started. But uh, it was still, you know, a unique experience. Experience to see all those UFO researchers, uh, some of the the most well known and respected, and hear their uh, comments about the Travis Walton case. How many people would you guess if you had to attended the the summit on any given I, day? I think in total there was maybe a hundred. Uh, I think we only had. Uh, the entire group there uh, up, you know, uh, about Saturday morning. Otherwise, it was 50 to 60 people in there for the most part. So, um, but I think at its peak was probably, uh, and from what I understand, about 100 people. Well, you know, that's not really that bad if you look at it in a way that it was kind of in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know how much timing was involved in the planning of this. But um, there were some pretty good speakers there as well, right? Yeah, great speakers and, uh, you know, great people. And it was very intimate. So uh, in that respect, you know, we got to have a lot of time with each other because, uh, uh, you know, which is always fun. Right, right. So what do we have going? We we didn't really do the news for two weeks. So you have a couple of things lined up. I do, and and you know, had I thought of that, well, I think we the news has been slow the last couple of weeks, so um, that's part of it. Plus, we didn't cover a lot because I was gone, but it was slow anyway. But I, I want to look, see, uh, make sure I don't miss anything big. But I think I've got some of the more fun stuff from the last few days uh, to talk about with you here. Great. So, what's the first one? The first one I talk about, want to talk about is a story which somewhat pertains to Travis Walton and his experience, and that is a scientist who just wrote uh, in Scientific American. Her name is Anne Skomoroski, and she's a psychiatrist and uh, an adjunct professor, I understand, as well at Columbia University. Uh, assistant professor of psychiatry, actually, um, but she also practices uh, psychosomatic medicine at New York Presbyterian Hospital. She wrote a paper suggesting that alien abduction could be due to accidental awareness. Accidental awareness is when people wake up during surgery 
which you can imagine is terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, research was done on this recently by a group, and uh, their findings are what led her to this. Now, she draws similarities between their findings and the Betty and Barney Hill case and uh, what they reported under hypnosis. Um, she talks about things such as uh, terror and uh, terror, what's called terror memory. So when we experience terror, uh, uh, terrifying moment, a very traumatic moment, how it causes PTSD often. And often we remember these, what happened in chunks and often flashbacks. And that's how I think it kind of relates to the Travis Walton story because that's how he describes uh, his memories coming back to him. And that was even portrayed in the movie Fire in the Sky. Right. Now, I don't exactly understand how that relates to like i mean i actually woke up during surgery myself oh my when I was gosh younger and wow. but i wasn't scared or anything i just saw you know people over me and all this stuff and then you know faded out but i totally remember it and i remember trying to move my arms because um <laughs> because i could see that i was naked <laughs> and i was trying to put the uh, johnny back down on me and, and it wouldn't move <laughs> i couldn't move my arms Oh, how funny. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So what she says is that, you know, these memories come back in chunks. So these people could have these flashbacks of being terrified and there are figures over them and they're on a surgery bed uh, having these things done to them and they may misinterpret those as alien beings. I think that's a valid point and that it's entirely possible that some people uh, have misinterpreted their accidental awareness flashbacks. However, she points out that out of the hundreds of people that were part of this study, she's talking about not one of them have claimed that they were an alien abductee so she has no examples of this actually happening so she's suggesting it the other problem is that she doesn't include all of the other experiences which don't fit whatsoever with betty and barney hill first of all you're talking about two people It'd be different if it was one person, but these are two people uh, having these memories together. Also, you know, they saw a UFO, and this was their conscious memory uh, prior to the event. Uh, Then all of the other things they remember up under hypnosis, such as uh, she remembers, you know, Betty uh, communicating and conversing with these creatures. So there's a lot of things, especially with the Betty Hill case, uh, that don't fit her idea, even with with a Travis Walton case. So perhaps there are some cases out there, but uh, I think people would agree uh, that, uh, and this is certainly what people are saying online, that it doesn't fit uh, the whole phenomenon. Well, also, did she go into how many people that are claiming that they were abducted that had surgery? Well, no, that's a really, that's a great point is that she doesn't go into that because there was no study done of actual alien abductees. But uh, I think given her paper, people who do that sort of research, uh, Barbara Lamb, Yvonne Smith, people like that, uh, Leo Sprinkle should be probably cognizant of this issue and uh, looking for these sort of signs as possibilities But uh, that's really all it is, is a suggestion and a possibility. Going back to Betty and Barney Hill, I was speaking with someone at the New England conference that was uh, very interested in that story and looked uh, back at it and also even spoke with the hypnotists of Betty and Barney Hill who, uh, you know, didn't really believe. He believed that they thought they saw what they did, but he didn't believe it really happened type of thing. But there's there's a light on top of Cannon Mountain. And she was driving by this um, almost on a daily basis, and it looked like it was moving, and it looked like it was in the sky. And I know exactly what she's talking about because out in Colorado where I used to live, I used to see a light like that. Well, the light went up in 1959. And so there's there's some question there that goes back and forth on the Betty and Barney Hill case, one of the most, what I always consider the most solid cases out there. (laughs) <laughs> could have a weak spot in it it's it's hard to say and uh yeah. it's you can find some information online um there's also like this jack o'lantern 
restaurant that's in the shape of a jack-o'-lantern that um, on that same report said it could possibly have been mistaken for the craft. But uh, that's stretching it a little bit because it's not a very big thing. Yeah, which is possible, but I think some of the more compelling stuff is, uh, especially when people like this remember the same things when they're regressed separately. I think that's pretty fascinating. And uh, there's only one other case of this I know I can think of, and that's the Allagash abductions. And mm-hmm. uh, we'll have that featured at the UFO Congress. Oh, really? Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I met two two out of the uh, four in that. And uh very solid uh, story. Very, it seems. Yeah, you know. That's right. You helped me reconnect with these guys because I did know them oh, yeah. years ago, so I could get them to the Congress. So thanks for your help on that. Yeah, they're actually going. That's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is, is it Jim and uh, who are the two that are going? Jim Weiner and Charlie Foltz. Oh yes, yeah, great guys. Great. Yeah, guys. really great guys. So what else is going on? What else? Oh, here's one that is creating a lot of controversy. And this is one that's funny because uh, it's funny that, uh, you know, I don't know if you have this, but there's a phenomena that happens where people now will just read the headlines and look at the pictures and they never read your stories. And it's so frustrating uh, for us, of course. And this is a case of this car getting abducted in North Dakota. And it is a video that's a hoax, you know. And that's what our story is about, how watch out for this video. It's a hoax. But so many people are getting so upset. That's a hoax. That's a hoax. And we're like, we know if you read the story, you'll see details on that. And, you know, we think it's important to report this kind of thing so people know that these are hoaxes. You know, we do this often with uh, different videos that uh, are known hoaxes because a lot of people will think they're real and uh, they don't know the details behind these videos and, and why they're hoaxes. And uh, some people are saying, oh, no one can believe that's real. Well, I wish that were the case, but unfortunately it's not. So we think it's an an important service to uh, let people know, you know, about these things. uh, I actually got an email about your story on your website from someone that was just saying that it's a hoax, it's a known hoax, and they're just doing it for the traffic. And, again, um, uh, that person possibly didn't read any of the story of this. Right, and it's certainly, uh, well, in a way, everything we do is for the traffic. We're hoping that it gets traffic, but we didn't pinpoint this case directly just for traffic, certainly. Um, trust us, these videos frustrate us as much as they do anybody. In fact, we get more pleasure out of pointing out the faults in these things to, to, to let people know that, hey, there's some problems with this video. Well, talking about videos, some of the ones that have gone the most viral on YouTube are you know cgi and 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 all of the ones that have gone most viral the most popular ufo video out there is one and i can't remember where they say it is but it's these ufos that are flying trees yeah over palm trees Mm -hmm. and uh luckily uh it was actually i can't remember it was a bigger newspaper that did a real great investigation uh and found out the guy who made it oh and this is a cool story too so they found out the guy who made it and he wanted to remain anonymous but he said he is a cgi guy for movies and he was just playing around and he decided to post this video he created that he thought turned out really cool and this uh person i think it was New York Times, or no, L.A. Times, I think, who discovered him, uh, said, well, prove to me that you are the guy who made this. And he said, okay, I'll post another video. And he posted a video, and this is fun. You see, it's called Naughty Grannies, which sounds worse than it is. <laughs> it is safe for work. And you see these grannies with this like remote control thing, and they're laughing and, and everything. And it pans out, and there's a miniature of one of these UFOs flying around over the, the – this by this cafe and these grannies are playing with it you know they're controlling it with this remote control so he proved that you know he and it looks great you know it looks real like this thing's really there flying around so um yeah that's a great example you know all of the there's that site that does a bunch of hoaxes that we talk about a lot to warn people and they get millions of hits they posted the mermaid stuff and they got millions of hits on that even though they don't own it so was that uh, third phase of the moon 
It's not third phase, but that's another great example. Um, but it's another site. I can't remember what it's called right now, but uh, that guy even got a hold of us and uh, got a little upset when we talked about one of his latest hoaxes. He said, I didn't know it was a hoax. Well, then I told him, well, what about these five or six others? You know these are hoaxes. <laughs> and he said, ha-ha, essentially, and just uh, said, thanks, talk to you later. Well, um, to, well to give you an idea... Of this, there's a part where that it's a Haiti UFO debunked. There you go. And that's in slow motion. This is just the debunked part. Got five million views. Whoa, mama! So that's you know the wild. original. I don't even know what the original got. Yeah, probably five hundred and thirty million. million. That's my guess. <laughs> All right, but not quite as much as Charlie fighting. His brother's finger, which is still the number one YouTube video. Is it really? Have you you've seen that, right? No, I. How haven't. Charlie? That hurt Charlie. I refuse to watch it. <laughs> I don't blame you. You know, some of the, the YouTubers are making uh, seven. I mean, over a million dollars a year. You're kidding me. Nope. It's amazing. Congrats. Yeah, it is. there's a site where you can estimate how much they make, and there was a researcher who estimated uh, how much, like for instance, third phase of Moon is making, and they're doing they're doing well. They're you know certainly enough income for someone to survive off of. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So yeah, yeah, and you know I, I'd like to do a whole. I, I sort of have done a whole show about you know the UFO hoaxes on YouTube a little bit with. Yeah. Uh, girl named sheila aliens a while back uh, right you know she's really focused she doesn't she doesn't really know that much about the ufo field in general but she is really keeping a uh, hawkeye on on videos oh yeah she does which is great and you know who else has a lot of good stuff and, and keeps an eye on it it's ben hansen i didn't realize that ben actually kept an eye on youtube yeah, he does. He keeps an eye out on how to tell those hoaxes and stuff like that. We we converse about that stuff quite a bit. Ah, wow. Yeah. All right, what else? Uh, we have a couple more stories, or is that... Yeah, we do, because we have a real video. Now, this is a video I believe to be real. Uh, I haven't heard back from some of the analysts yet, but this is a MUFON case written by Roger Marsh, the MUFON director of communications who writes, uh, you know, about... Oh, move on cases on our site and uh, this is some night vision video that this gentleman posted in michigan and he says it was about 8 p.m on november 2nd when he was using his night vision and he saw these three dots this you know in a triangular form shooting across the sky he told his buddy check it out check it out his buddy did not have night vision so he couldn't see it so later, this guy says he reviewed the night vision, and they were looking at what he says are chemtrails. He reviewed the night vision, and he said there were more UFOs that he saw in the video, and he thinks the chemtrails were there to cover up the sky so they wouldn't be able to see this craft. Of course, they did a terrible job because he was able to see it. Um, and uh, that was his theory. I'm not so sure about the chemtrail thing. Yeah, that's or, another one. Another yeah. one about chemtrails. Well, there's, yeah, and then the other things that he thinks are UFOs, I'm not, I don't see it personally. However, I do see the lights that are in the triangular formation, and they are really, really interesting. Yeah, this thing's shooting across, so I think it's a great video. One of the other funny aspects about this video is that he's shooting his laser at it, and he even concludes he thinks it was a stealth or some sort of uh, top secret uh, aircraft that we have. Well, my friend, shooting a laser at it is illegal. Don't Absolutely. do that. Hmm. Uh, you know, and, you know, pilots talk about how they get blinded. And right. I just am not for this whole idea of shooting lasers at these things when you don't know what they are. That's a terrible, terrible idea. And, and uh, pilots have talked about getting blinded and actually causing, making it very dangerous for them. And if you get caught doing that, it's, uh, it's jail time. Yeah, I believe so. Mm-hmm. Felony. Mm-hmm. Are, we, are we done all our stories? Uh, I've got one more if you got time. Sure, yeah, we got time, yeah. I just think this is really cool because I have become a fan of this gentleman for several reasons, and that is Tom DeLong. 
Funny enough, he is famous for being the front man of the band Blink-182. A lot of people oh, yes. like that band. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, you know, I'm not so much as into the band, uh, at least Blink-182. Uh, but he also has a shoe. Uh, he makes shoes called Macbeth Shoes. And they're my absolute favorite shoes ever for, for hanging out. They're kind of skater shoes, but he does a vegan line. And I only buy vegan stuff. I don't buy any leather. So uh, that's another reason I'm a fan. But I'm really a fan, too, because he's into UFOs. Mm-hmm. He's, he ran this cool site called Strange Times for a while uh, where he followed UFOs and paranormal stuff. He's done some interviews on this, and he's very intelligent and well-spoken and uh, educated in on the matter uh, on ufos and so i think he does a great job when he's been on tv debating and talking about this stuff so i just think he's a really cool guy and it looks like he's going to be restarting He's kind of alluding to restarting Strange Times, but maybe not just being a website. He has this picture that he posted on Instagram of him at Area 51, and it says Strange Times. So we're kind of excited about what this new incarnation of Strange Times will be. It looks like at least he's going to have some kind of video episode of him investigating Area 51. But this is kind of exciting for any Tom DeLonge fans, for really, I think, any UFO fans, because it's great when high-profile people get into this stuff, I think, because it just lends even more visibility um, to the topic. As long as they don't go whacked about it. And you, I think we talked earlier um, a couple months ago about him having a sighting, didn't we? We did. I can't remember the details of that yet, but uh, in fact, I think I even remember kind of thinking that it wasn't uh, an actual a real sighting, <laughs> like a bird or something. Yeah. But yeah, I did have a, a sighting not too long ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess that'll do it, um, Alejandro. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll have you back. All here right. Next week. Thank you. It sounds like a lot of fun. I always enjoy it, and uh, we'll talk to you soon, buddy. You bet. Okay, so hang in there for the uh, music break. Uh, music by Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse. And coming right up, we'll have Doug Trumbull and Mark D'Antonio. Welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it seems, I don't know if it's my headset or what, but uh, you may, um, I'll ask Keith, is the sound a little bit low? You just uh, tell me what you yeah. need. Do I need? Oh, <clears throat> all right. This is, this is always fun Sounds in my fine, radio. <laughs> Doug, um, yes. I want to thank you. It's the first time you've been on the show, and it's, it's a great honor to have you on. And... Um, Someone who actually worked on the film 2000 a Space, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Incredible. Can you uh, give the listening audience your background and, and, uh, and then how it kind of filtered in to the UFO? Or was that something you had an interest in all along? Well, it was very hard for me to grow up in this country without being exposed to UFOs uh, on the cover of uh, 
and Popular Mechanics and everything else, and Life Magazine, and Look Magazine. Uh, I was born in the early 40s, and uh, it was just part of the culture. And then there were the, the whole spate of B-movies all about alien invasions and every conceivable kind of havoc that could be wrought by aliens. So that was a, the context that I grew up in. And then I personally became very interested in science fiction, and I was reading all about you know other planets and uh, Heinlein and Clark and Asimov and all these writers and uh, and as I became an art artist, which was not until I was in my late teens and early twenties, my portfolio filled up with uh, alien planets and science fiction type book covers, which landed me a job at a company in Hollywood that was doing uh, movies for NASA and the Air Force about space because it seemed to be a natural place to put me. And uh, we did a job for the New York World's Fair called To the Moon and Beyond, which was a film about um, infinity in a way. It was like about everything from the Big Bang to, to the microcosm in 20 minutes for a World's Fair Expo uh, on a giant dome screen and 10 per 70 millimeter film. And I was a young illustrator working on that film, and then Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Clarke saw that film, hired our company to do preliminary designs for 2001 A Space Odyssey, which at that time was called Journey Beyond the Stars. And uh, it led to me getting a job working with Stanley Kubrick on 2001. Wow. Hey, Doug, um, is, your, is your headset on and plugged in yes. at all? Yes, it is. It is. It, it's just sounding. Um, it's sounding like it's not either engaged or uh, the settings aren't aren't uh, set right on your computer or something. We sounded better earlier, actually. Um, so at this point, if you can check that out, I'm going to zoom over and ask uh, Mark. Um, Mark, now you have known Doug and worked with Doug. Um, do you want to? Yeah. And you you are a past guest. Uh, we know a lot about you. Maybe not the new listeners, but. Um, for someone that is just tuning in and hearing you for the first time, can you give um, the new listener uh, your background and what you do and all that? Sure. The, uh, the high-altitude summary is that uh, I'm uh, the Mutual UFO Network's chief photo and video analyst, which means that I get to look at all kinds of interesting photos and videos from all around the world uh, that come in. <clears throat> and we try to figure out uh, what we're looking at. And uh, at times... Uh, we're not sure. At other times, we're quite sure. And 95 to 99 percent in that range, somewhere in between, of all the videos and photos we get are <clears throat> explainables. And uh, that just means that we don't have enough information sometimes to make a final disposition that says, you know, there's something, um, you know, specific about them that uh, makes them, uh, you know, a, a plane or whatever. Sometimes we don't have that information. But we try very hard to come up with uh, a way to explain it. And <clears throat> there's a confusion as to why that doesn't make me a debunker. Mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to be very hard on the data, and that's what we've talked about in previous shows with you, right? We right. have to be hard on the data because if we're not, then we're doing a disservice to every single person that looks at MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, and wants to join and become part of an organization that has science as its core and the desire to answer those questions about our solitude in the universe. And so when we have uh, the opportunity to explore a video that looks interesting, we have incumbent upon us, it's incumbent upon us to, to look at it and try to explain it in a way that makes sense given um, the the uh, human history on our planet uh, is it an aircraft? Uh, we've developed air for aircraft. Is it an aircraft? Is it a drone? Is it a new uh, vehicle that we can't explain? Um, and that kind of thing. <clears throat> and we hope for uh, what we call the Grail is we hope for seeing something that uh, we just simply cannot explain. Every path we go down, we can't explain. So that's my MUFON background. My, my degree is actually astronomy, so I, I actually am well-placed <laughs> to mm -hmm. do this. And <clears throat> I own a business that does visual effects and model making, which is, of course, part of the reason that I work with Doug. We initially got together based on uh, a UFO interest. But then he saw that I have this, this 
a website full of uh, cool-looking models, and he says, hey, we could use that right now. Next thing you know, um, I wasn't prepared for 18-hour days with Douglas Trumbull, who's been an idol of mine ever since I was a child. Um, and hey, here we are working together, and I kept shaking my head and pinching myself, saying, this isn't real, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and now... And now we're very, very close friends. He's an he's a, 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 a amazing human being. And uh, we have a, a number of things that we're working on together in the unidentified flying object arena. Great. And, uh, Doug, do you want to elaborate on, on what your – I saw your Hummer. Wow, is that something? Um, <laughs> you you want to talk a little bit about that? And if we're having trouble with your headset, if you, just, if you get a little closer to the computer, it might, be, uh, it might work better. Well, I'm right on top of my microphone, and I want to make sure I'm on the right. Is that better right now? Uh, it sounds worse? sounds good to me, and I'm sorry for the listener that um, uh, we'll we'll get through this. Up. Um, the producer of the show will chime in in a second, but it sounds pretty good to me. Okay, good. Uh, so, what was the question? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, can you um, can you uh, elaborate on? What um, what this Hummer, the equipment on there, is all about, and what, you can talk also about the Uvatog um, in general, um, your okay. your development of that uh, amazing new uh, film uh, that you pat you patented the process that you you patented. Um, I am at loss for it's, words, so it's uh, called, it's the microphone magic. to you. It's called, it's, it's called Magi, and I'll try to elaborate on that more clearly. Um, Quite a few years ago, maybe 15 years ago, um, as I began as I began to mature in my life, I'm asking myself, well, you know, what is this all about, and what am I going, and what's it, or what am I going to do next? I actually consciously asked myself if there was, in fact, possibly anything to the whole UFO thing, because I grew up on it, I was immersed in it, I was making movies about it, I was making money on it. And I was asking myself, well, um, is this really worth looking into? And maybe it's possible um, that there's something to it that I should pay attention to. And, uh, and first of all, let me, are you hearing me okay right now? Oh, yes, you're fine now. Thank you. Uh, okay, good. So my wife and I went to uh, a MUFON convention up in uh, Utica, New York, I think, quite a few years, many years ago. And uh, had this experience of finding a, a wide range of people interested in whatever it is that's going on. And I was particularly struck by the veracity and uh, dedication and persistence of very, very serious uh, aircraft flight controllers and doctors and surgeons and lawyers and people who had had experiences that they couldn't explain. And I'm connecting this to my own experience of, you know, working on Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which was you know, supposedly fictional. And anyway, it led to um, my desire to actually explore it a little bit more. And I, I began exploring it from the point of view of amateur astronomy. And I bought a couple of telescopes and started looking at the night sky. And I thought, well, you know, I actually do have this unusual skill set that comes from motion picture uh, production, particularly special effects production, which is um, very sophisticated digital cameras, tracking systems, and what we call motion control in the movie industry, which is the ability to very, very accurately control the positioning of a camera to, you know, a thousandth of an inch or arc wow. second or whatever, which we use for motion picture visual effects when we're shooting miniatures. I thought, well, I could apply that skill to trying to photograph UFOs because I don't really know what's going on, and I would really like to know. And what I was asking people at the MUFON convention was, has anybody out there actually applied significant, serious, scientific, optical, electro-optical, spectrographic analysis to the study of UFOs? And the answer was no. I thought, well, okay. I'm going to make this my next hobby, and I'm going to try to figure out how to do it. So I started exploring this, and I actually commissioned the construction of this amazing uh, device that's called a theodolite, which is basically a 
panning and tilting uh, motor controlled telescope platform from a friend of mine named Mike Sorensen, who does, you know, Academy Award winning motion control systems for movies. And we spent many months designing and building this thing, which was all designed to be field de deployable. It could break down into pieces. Uh, it could be set up by an individual in the field by themselves. And it had tremendous accuracy. It was able to rotate 360 degrees in about a second. Very scary, high-powered servo motors. And then I found other people that uh, helped me out, and I found a, a program that I don't can't even remember what it was at the time, but it was basically a uh, product uh, control, process control, digital camera system, which is ordinarily used in you know like Coca-Cola factories to make sure that the bottle caps are on correctly. Mm. And uh, I found this program that could be adapted to my purposes, so that. I hooked it up to a, what I call an all-sky camera, and I later found out that all-sky cameras are not uncommon in the astronomical community. And I, I met a guy at uh, Santa Barbara Instruments Group who helped me with this and who was also a dedicated uh, uh, UFO-interested person. And I bought this camera system that would photograph the, the night sky down to fifth-magnitude stars in two-second exposures. And this would be captured by a CCD camera. It would go into my computer. And if anything in the field of view moved, it would trigger an alert and an alarm. And that would know exactly where in the sky some anomaly had occurred. Whether it was a plane or a bat or a, anything that moved would be triggered. And the telescope platform would instantaneously pan and tilt and aim at that subject matter and start recording. And then I went so far as to purchase this old 1985 ex-military Humvee from Fort Hood in Texas through a dealer in Los Angeles, and I tore the roof out of it and put my telescope in there so the telescope could pop up out of the roof of this Humvee. And we fixed the air conditioning, we fixed the heating, and we designed this whole thing. So that the idea was to be able to go... Uh, as intrepid explorers and go out to the unknown territories <laughs> and break through fences and forge streams and climb rocky mountains and go to inaccessible places to photograph UFOs. Um, so that was kind of my objective. And, and I also wanted to have some what we would call production value because I thought this will look really cool, we'll document the whole thing, and we'll make a little documentary about uh, chasing UFOs or whatever. And it will lead to, uh, hopefully, some kind of feature motion picture or a television series or a reality series or something. I didn't know what. I was just, you know, on a lark about the whole thing. So to make a long story short, I got to the point where I realized that through various other sources and meeting people like, like Mark and other people in the territory of UFO uh, knowledge, that, in fact, they could be anywhere any time, any place, and you really didn't need to go forward mountains. You could actually go in your backyard or drive down the street, and you were just as likely to find a UFO anywhere on the planet as anywhere else. Right. And so that, that ultimately changed my entire perspective on the quest for photographing UFOs. And the whole UFOTOG project, it's U-F-O-T-O-G, which means UFO photography, UFO photog. F-O-T-O-G is photography. It's an old term used for uh, news photographers. Uh. And that was my name for the project. I called it UFOTOG. And I had Mike Sorensen actually emboss it into the front of the camera and into the theodolite. And I used that as a logo. And that's what I called the project was UFOTOG. So I could talk forever about this, but I've come to the conclusion that um, the entire search for UFOs is a completely different thing from what I thought. And I no longer feel that I, I need the theodolite. I don't feel I need the uh, Humvee. Um, and now uh, Mark and I are embarked on this completely new change of course, yes, which is I've to... Yes, i heard briefly about fabric. it. Okay. These are the well, units. Well, Mark can probably tell it to you better. Yeah, the units that we think could be deployed in the hundreds all over the planet. 
and be autonomous and self-powered and uh, collaborate with one another and triangulate and be looking at the night sky all night long because in retrospect, I realized I was not prepared as a human being to go sit, you know, at four corners in Mex- New Mexico and wait for three years for a UFO to fly by. <laughs> you know, the, the thing about that is, you know, they, they say, you know, there are hot spots in places where, you know, something shows up quite a bit. But I was wondering that when it, the very first time I saw, I, th- I believe there was a video, wasn't there, of the Hummer? Yes. Yeah, I saw that, and I was thinking, where are they going to go? Where you know, where are they going to um, see something? And I, yeah, sitting in that thing all night long would be good for a day or two. But after a while, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah, well, right. yeah. That that the funny thing about that though, right, is that uh, Doug and I both looked at this, and we kind of imagined um, the autonomy here, which is how this all started, I think, and we felt that we want to kind of abstract the human being from the process of having to watch. And with the current levels of technology that are out there, um, we're kind of almost there. So we actually have a little uh, a science team of very high-end prestigious people that are working behind the scenes with us to help us make this come to a reality. And and, because you're not going to do this, first of all, cheaply, um, not for the initial units anyway. And secondly, uh, in order to do it, it requires an awful lot of research. So research has been going on, as Doug will tell you, for uh, it's been years now that uh, there's certain types of research that have been that has been undertaken, and um, we have some milestones that um, we think we're going to meet in the next few months, uh, which are really exciting. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? The milestones. Uh, <clears throat> well. Um, or is it top secret? No, no. I mean, it, it's, it's something that, that Doug and I have both mentioned, uh, you know, publicly before, and that is that you know there, there's no um, camera out there that satisfies our needs. So um, we have to um, build one, basically, build a camera that will do what we need. And uh, once we have that camera, and that's anywhere from three to six months away, for all we know at this point, you know, based on the current. You know, understanding of where the the, the research development has gone. Um, you know, we we have some time to plan for what to expect, and based on what the camera is going to look like, that affects every other instrument on the package that we deploy. Now, you know, as I've said, you know, and, and Doug and I have talked, we have a land-based unit and we have a sea-based unit. We're going to do the land-based units first because. Um, you know, first of all, when we when we look up in the sky, we keep thinking night sky. It doesn't have to be the night sky. Our mm-hmm. instrument palette can work all day long, too, because there's daytime sightings as well. In fact, why cut out 50% of your viewing window just because the sun's out? Um, <clears throat> it just means you have to have different instruments because you're not going to see a tiny little white light, if it's that's what it is, go blazing across a bright blue sky. Uh, at night you would, but during the day maybe you'll detect uh, some type of radiation, or maybe you'll see weird magnetic properties suddenly appear. You know, we don't know. So you know, we have that to you know realize it's sort of a a little bit of a paradigm shift because you have to say, hey, we're not just looking at night; we're looking in the day too. And then uh, when you look in the ocean, uh, it's a whole different set of instrumentation because we're not looking up; we're looking down. We're looking for unknown submerged objects when we talk about putting these things in the ocean. Um, and I think I might have mentioned to you, Martin, that I've actually, you know, I witnessed an unknown submerged object when, yes. uh, as a guest on a nuclear submarine back in the 90s, and it blew me away. Um, I wasn't a sailor, I wasn't in the Navy, but I had you know, worked on a project that you know, put me in the sub um, sort of as a thank you, you know, because it was something I've always wanted to do. And back then, it was okay to do that. So, uh, you know, I saw that really, really odd thing, and, you know, they said it, it was something moving through the ocean at hundreds of knots. Mm-hmm. Now, in the mid-'90s, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, um, what was moving through the ocean at hundreds of knots? Nothing that we have, nothing that anyone on this planet has at the time. So, you know, and I say at the time because it doesn't mean we have all these secret devices now because we really don't. But there is one Russian torpedo that's a rocket that moves at 200 knots in the water because it's making this massive, giant steam plume in front of it. But that's, you know, wow. you hear that coming from, you know, half a continent away. 
Right. Um, and this was a really tiny line. So, you know, we have those anomalies, too. And so, you know, what, what Doug is now uh, talking about is, you know, having multiples of these little guys, these little platters that we deploy uh, out in Arizona or hot spots. You know, we, Doug and I actually have a hot spot list that we're not sharing with anybody at this point because uh, we, we do have a list that we started to compile, and we don't want anyone to know about that list because um, we have a long way to go yet before we, you know, set these things down on dirt. Yeah, um, speaking of that, um, I'm picturing, you know, in my head, I'm picturing this unit, like, say, uh, two feet by two feet by two feet or something like that, and then on a post or whatever it is. Um, how are you going to protect these things when you put them in remote areas so they're not either vandalized or even, you know, <laughs> cut or uh, taken away and all yeah, that? Doug, you've had some ideas on that too, right? I mean, we we've well, talked I think about that, these. I think that the first thing you have to design for is that you're going to lose a lot of them from mm-hmm. poaching or people who are just think they're you know funny people that want to just get your stuff and you know do some kind of treasure hunt against you or uh, animals or birds or bird shit or <laughs> rain or weather or animal dookie or anything that could happen when you've got stuff deployed remotely. Um, and I think it's really fun to imagine, well, how do you defend against that? How do you deploy these things into relatively safe locations, which is, let's say this module is the size of a dinner plate and it has multiple cameras and sensors and uh, photo cells and a battery and a, an antenna or whatever. It's completely autonomous, and it's going to sit and look at the sky 24 hours a day and just look at anything that's moving around. And it's going to see uh, – I'll, I'll go into this separately, but it's going to see everything that's moving in the sky. So I, let's keep that as a separate item. But um, they've got to be so low cost that you're not going to freak out when one of them gets lost or damaged or destroyed or stolen or anything else. Secondly, you want to deploy them in such a way that's really intelligent so that they're in good, probable locations. They are in triangulated locations from one another so that they can, in fact, look at the sky and triangulate so that you can get accurate uh, information regarding altitude, um, velocity, trajectory, uh, and all kinds of other sensory stuff. And they can all talk to each other, and then they can all download to some central nervous system that's going to process the data. And once that data comes in, you're going to put in place hundreds, if not thousands, of filters. And you're going to say, well, ignore clouds. Ignore astronomical phenomena that we know about. Ignore Venus. Ignore the night sky. Ignore 40,000 celestial objects. Ignore airplanes. Ignore satellites. And you've got to train the system to ignore what would otherwise be possibly misinterpreted by Mm. ordinary human beings and say, look for transient anomalies that behave erratically. And I'm not talking about cicadas or birds or bugs or all the other things that behave erratically. You've got to find some kind of filtering system, and that's really part of the science of being able to correlate um, simultaneously multispectral data. So that if you saw a light, you would immediately query, well, is it, what, in what spectrum is that light? Is that infrared light? Is it ultraviolet light? Is it visible light? Is it invisible, deep infrared light? Is it emitting gamma rays? Is there something other about it that would make it interesting to a computer to record and follow? So setting up all those parameters is actually going to be a big science project that will not happen overnight and that will require serious investment and serious development, and we're all very passionate and determined to figure this out. And that's why we have wonderful guys like Chuck Modlin, who is a super genius at this kind of stuff. Yeah. And, wow. and, it, and, it re, and it reminds me of, you know, we're on a very special day today because today, uh, mm-hmm. this afternoon, was when Rosetta landed right. on Comet 67P. That's right. You know, 310 million miles from here. And it's this weird little thing that weighs a little over 200 pounds, and it's landing on a comet, and it's taking spectroscopy and surface samples, and it has onboard spectroscopic gas analyzers, and it can detect organic chemicals. It has magnetometers. 
It has all this stuff on board. And that's very akin to what we want to do. And we want to do it for the purpose of identifying, you know, some weird, supposedly extraterrestrial or otherworldly phenomena. It's not like we're looking for organic life or water or hydrogen or any of the other things that these wonderful uh, sensors are looking for. We're looking for something else. Yeah, and then, and to to add on to that, Doug, one of the things that you know, we've talked about, Martin, is that none of this stuff. Whereas we do need research, we're actually leveraging a lot of existing technologies, and yeah. we're able to take existing technologies and push it just a little bit uh, and use it for our purposes. Uh, one such thing that you know we we can talk about is that we're actually uh, utilizing GPS satellites to communicate our alerts to us. And we're leveraging existing technology that's out there in order to do it. Um, the, the spin on it, though, is that we're, at, we're, we're customizing the message a little bit. So that what comes to us is something that's a little bit more um, pertinent to us specifically. So, you know, we, we, and that stuff already works, by the way. That, that stuff's working now, you know, right? And that's because we're leveraging something that already exists. So there's a lot of existing tech out there um, you can go buy a camera that will look in the infrared. You can buy a camera that will get UV data. You can, of course, every other camera looks at the visible spectrum. But we don't have a way to see it all at once. You know, that's another hurdle that we're looking at right now. <clears throat> and uh, Chuck is involved with that heavily. And so we have a lot of uh, uh, instrumentation that will help us when we see just this one little thing going across the sky. Because in the UFO world, as, as Doug and I have talked about, is it's, it's where you, you have that one photo, it's a bad photo, or it's a lousy handheld shaking video. And that's the only evidence. <clears throat> and people are saying, and this is the real thing. Well, how can it be the real thing if we can't even really see the real thing, the thing at all? Because it's a shaky cell phone video. The whole point of these, these platters, as we like to call them, uh, is that they are creating corroborative data it's data that you know corroborating you know like if one instrument sees something um in the visible light spectrum um guess what the magnetometer is also registering something weird for instance uh you know and by the way it emitted a burst of gamma rays for a split second i mean that's corroborating data taken individually each of those things may not mean a whole lot the one single light eh, could be anything, a satellite, a plane, you know, uh, a bird with LEDs around its neck, <laughs> okay? But it could also, uh, taken with the gamma rays and, say, magnetometer readings, um, now it means something, you see? So the evidence trail mounts, and that corroborating data helps us paint a picture uh, of what happened in, with a particular event. That's where we're going with this. Wow. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I'd like to mention is that along those lines that uh, Marcus is talking about is that I had the pleasure of going up to the, what's called the uh, U.S. Air Force Space Surveillance Telescope on hmm. the island of Maui. You know anything about that? No, I don't. <laughs> well, it's a very large astronomical type telescope, but their task is to look at satellites in orbit. And among many other things, but they uh, they're looking at satellites that are launched by other countries for other purposes, and they want to characterize the satellites. And so I went to a two day conference up there, which is very you know very open. There's no real secrets about it, and I learned a lot about spectroscopic analysis and other processes that are related to what's called blind deconvolution which is that when you get a really lousy, fuzzy, out-of-focus, jiggly image, you can put it through a computer and actually this could be quite a clear image that you wouldn't have even known was there. And that includes spectroscopic analysis where they can look at this little light passing over the sky at night or daytime or whatever and say, oh, it's 22.5% aluminum and 33.5% titanium, and whatever. They do a, a complete spectroscopic characterization of the satellite to figure out what it's made out of. I thought, well, you know, that's not rocket science. That's common everyday technology that's used in that industry. 
And we need to take a cue from that and say, how can we apply it to what we're trying to find out, which is completely unknown. We don't know what it's going to do, emit, or look like, or in what spectrum it's going to be. So we have to be completely broad-based about it. But uh, I think we can find out a huge amount of information if we, if we make the effort. I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, Doug, we're um, at the top of our first hour. If you could just throw out your website real quickly, if you would. Uh, I can't remember what my website is, but I think it's <laughs> www.douglastrumbull.com. I'm pretty that's sure it Trumbull is, too. Spelled <laughs> T-R-U-M-B-U-L-L. Just like the artist. Com. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that's it for the show. If you're listening live... Hang in there for the second hour if you're listening as a podcast and want to listen to the second part of the show. You can subscribe right now on our website, podcastufo.com, or in the future at getjoyride.com. And if you are a current subscriber or have donated in the past, I will happily send you an MP3 download link. You can check out the links in our show notes for tonight's UFO News, and I want to thank everyone for helping out with the show today. Keith Rowland, producer of the Dark Matter Radio Network. Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse for our music. Peggy Shunning for managing our Facebook page. Remember to like us on Facebook for all the latest UFO and astronomy news. You can check us out live right here next week on the Dark Matter Radio Network. And every Wednesday starting at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, And don't forget to jump in the chat room at podcastufo.com. This is Martin Willis reminding you to keep your eyes to the sky.